Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. Hey, Dig listeners, this series, we are talking about bodies, not exactly a topic that we shy away from here on the podcast, (laughs) but uh, the series, we're going to go all in. So the history of the body is a hot topic in the field of academic history, and all of our own research touches on aspects of studying the body in one way or another. Today, we're going to look at miscarriage in the 19th century. Elizabeth and I actually explored early um, pregnancy in two previous episodes, one called Family Limitation in Early America and another called Birth Control and Abortion Before Roe v. Wade. In those episodes, we focused a lot on understandings of women's reproduction in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. We encourage you to listen to those episodes to get a deeper understanding of women's conceptions of their pregnant bodies and what pregnancy and personhood meant to women in prior centuries. So today, we're going to focus closely on just the issue of miscarriage in the 19th century. I recently read a book by historian Shannon Withycomb entitled Lost Miscarriage in the 19th Century that puts miscarriage at the center of the study of 19th century science, medicine, and women's experience with their reproductive bodies. And to be perfectly honest, Withycomb's findings were not what I expected to find when I began reading. We tend to think of miscarriage today as something extremely difficult and sad. In fact, there's kind of a cultural taboo around even talking about miscarriage. So many people who experience miscarriage can feel isolated and alone, left to feel like they're experiencing and dealing with their miscarriage by themselves, which is far from reality as estimates put modern miscarriage rates at between 15 to 30 percent of all pregnancies. Some of our modern silence around miscarriage perhaps manifests because we as a society don't know how to talk about miscarriage or how to empathize with people who have experienced it. So miscarriage lives in this sort of hushed, sad silence. But one thing Withicombe highlights in her book is how common miscarriage is and how in the 19th century, miscarriage wasn't always a hushed or silent event or even a particularly sad event in all circumstances. It also shows how our modern day feelings about miscarriage are culturally constructed and can change as society changes. This is, of course, in no way to diminish the pain and heartache felt by those who experience miscarriage, but just to point out that our modern day sensibilities do not necessarily reflect the same feelings and experiences of those living in the 19th century. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Sarah. And we are your historians for this episode of Dig. We want to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon supporters, but especially our auger and excavator level patrons. Colin, Peggy, Christopher, and Lauren, y'all rock, and your good faith and donations help keep this podcast going. Listener, if you are not yet a patron, you can go to patreon.com slash digpodcast to learn more. Framing miscarriage in the 19th century gives us a really interesting way of looking at the massive changes that happened in America in the 19th century. The Industrial Revolution and what some historians call the Market Revolution spurred massive movements and migrations of people all over the continent. This resulted in people moving away from their families and extended kin networks. Additionally, a massive uptick in reading took place as newspapers, instruction books, and novels gained vast amount of readership. These two phenomena drastically changed how reproduction, pregnancy, and miscarriage were experienced in the 19th century as opposed to centuries past. We'll look at migration and movements first. Prior to the 19th century, America was primarily an agrarian nation. Although trends that pushed people out of this lifestyle and into more urban areas began earlier, it was during the 19th century that this movement really had a dramatic effect on how people lived and worked. 
As labor in the household changed, so too did social networks. Prior to the 19th century, women's reproductive capabilities were largely within the purview of women. Networks of women consisting of mothers, daughters, cousins, aunts, neighbors, and trusted midwives took care of the bodily needs of women in childbirth and in miscarriage. Female friends and relatives came to provide comfort, knowledge, and practical help when a woman went into labor or to assist after a miscarriage. For most 17th and 18th century women, their lives were spent in a prolonged period of childbearing, nursing, and caring for children. The average age of marriage was around 22, and a woman's last child would be born around the age of 40. This meant that a mother could be giving birth to her youngest child around the time that her firstborn was giving birth to her granddaughter Mm -hmm. right so family size oh oh i was just gonna say that we think of that as kind of like odd now Mm -hmm. totally um but it's still i mean it's still fairly common it's not it's not as certainly not as common as it was in the 19th century i think that sometimes when that happens we're like oh weird you know but i know people growing up i know people who they had a child and a grandchild that were the same age. I mean, yeah. I mean, I guess really, I could be the same way. My son just turned, my stepson yeah. just turned eighteen, right? And so he could definitely have a child right now, and then I'd be a grandmother with also like a little kid at home. So, yeah, yeah. You never Aww. know. Grammy Elizabeth. Grammy Elizabeth. You'd be the hot grandma. <laughs> Please no. <laughs> All right. Um, where was it? Family okay. size. Yeah. Um, family size decreased as the centuries wore on, but families were still large and child raising and domestic tasks were still extremely burdensome. So when a woman went to childbed or suffered a miscarriage, women friends, kinfolk, and midwives stepped in not only to assist in delivery and recovery, but perhaps more importantly, assisted in the care of the rest of the household. Um, So that could mean, you know, preparation of foods, laundry, cleaning, that kind of thing. This woman-centered labor was extremely important for carrying on the day-to-day activities of the household, while also acting as a way to share knowledge about women's reproduction. I mean, if you think about it, these women saw and participated in a lot of pregnancies and miscarriages throughout their lifetime, right? right? Like, that that's just a lot of knowledge to be gained. Yeah. It was something that they experienced in their own bodies and saw in their own eyes. Um, Male physicians were rarely called in for these kinds of life events and usually only for cases of emergency. Mm -hmm. Reproduction primarily rested within the purview of women. In the late 18th and early 19th century, this began to change and for a number of reasons. Midwives, once considered an important element of any community, slowly began to be replaced by male physicians. The dominant narrative surrounding the rise of male physicians argued that male doctors began to assert their authority over women's reproduction through the professionalization of medical knowledge and the desire to profit from that expertise, all while demonizing midwives' lack of scientific expertise. That is definitely part of the larger story, but not all of it. There were other factors that created this change as well. The massive changes happening in American industry and the economy also had a part to play. Throughout the early 19th century, more and more families began to work within the market economy. Mostly men, but women too, began working outside of the home in factories for wages. Additionally, many households began to bring industrial work into the home to be assembled by family members. Um, And just as an aside, a really good book that chronicles this shift is Paul Johnson's Sam Patch, The Famous Jumper. Which I am 100% obsessed with. I love this book. It's one of my favorites. At its core, it's a book about a famous waterfall jumper, but it's 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 kind of a bonkers story. Yeah, it's right? pretty bonkers. Yeah. <laughs> but it it also chronicles how many families weathered this this change from agrarian self sufficiency to entry into the market economy. Um, But as families navigated these economic changes, many families moved away from the social networks that they had traditionally been a part of. This meant that women no longer had these vast networks of women friends and relatives to aid and assist in reproduction like their grandmothers had in years past. Meanwhile, more, mostly male, physicians began to study at European and American medical schools and were anxious to ply their trade. Physicians began to form social and professional organizations and leadership. Mm -hmm. This coincided with a kind of information revolution that also was taking place. 
Throughout the first half of the 19th century, literacy rates among American-born white people skyrocketed up to 90% in 1850. It's always something that I think students find very surprising is how high literacy was in early America. Like, they sort of think, like, everyone was a bumpkin. But, no, the print culture proliferated. The market revolution facilitated these rising reading levels because reading material was more readily available. The steam printing press and shortened shipping times aided by transportation innovations like the Erie Canal made it easier for people to get their hands on books, magazines, and health and wellness guides. Medical manuals for both medical practitioners and lay people flourished, and more and more people began to gain their health and wellness knowledge not from their wise grandmother, but from the latest health guides. These kinds of books were in no way new, but in the 1840s, publishers focused on books and pamphlets particularly aimed at women and women's health. For example, there was the popular encyclopedic Guns Domestic Medicine, or our personal favorite, Edward Dixon's Woman and Her Diseases from the Cradle to the Grave, (laughs) just to name a few. Woman and Her Diseases. Side note, have you ever read Aristotle's Masterpiece? Which is one of these. No. It's been continuous. It was continuously in print from like 1619 or something well into it becomes really popular in the 1840s. Yeah. And it's it's like half sex manual, half women's health manual. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> I make my students read parts of it. What, and they're what, like, like, what is it? It's just it's like. It, it's partly like a health guide in that it kind of explains like hu- the humoral theory a little bit. Uh-huh. But then it's got parts in it that are about like hysteria, like literally wandering womb. Mm. Um, you know, the, like if you're a woman, be acting crazy. It's because her womb is all dried up and <laughs> floating around her body. Um, but then it's also things like, did your baby come out looking like a dog? That's because your wife's been looking at dogs. Oh, like, wow. It's just, it, and then it like, it covers everything. But then the second half of it is really interesting because it's all kind of like a guide for midwives, like mm. how to deliver a baby. Like uh-huh. and and for women themselves, like this is what does it mean if, you know, your body is doing this? It's kind of like what's that American girl? Oh, you know, well, like the like, care and keeping of you. Yeah, like it's yeah, that yeah. kind of but from yeah. like the eighteen forties. It's your body, but yeah. for girls. It's, yeah. It's wild. Anyway, these okay. things are so fun to read. Okay. Well, Case in point, right? These were very popular, and they yeah. might not have been written at the period, but but they were in were, were con- in continuous print. Yes, right? yes, Which and they were accessible. Is how, and it also shows you how these kind of the, the rise of quote unquote rise of like scientific knowledge could coincide with still people following this kind of yes. humoral um, idea of medicine. Absolutely, right? yeah. yeah. Those kind they they, they just coincided. Because, yeah, just because professional medicine arises in the mid 19th century doesn't mean that all of that folk medicine just disappears disappeared right 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 so these domestic health manuals helped physicians convince female readers of the importance of medical intervention in the case of miscarriage Hmm. previously most women went through miscarriage as they had done with childbirth among trusted female friends family and midwives in the case of miscarriage they perhaps even experienced it alone or with their spouse and close family members bleeding and cramping until it was done rarely was a doctor brought in as miscarriage was considered a normal part of many women's reproductive lives. Only when there were complications, such as maybe convulsions, excessive or extensive bleeding, or severe fever, was medical assistance sought out. As regular doctors, and regular is a term that professional doctors use to sort of distinguish themselves from untrained healers or quacks, um, as regular doctors gained more knowledge and access to women's reproduction, they also increased their focus on the medicalization of miscarriage and their clinical expertise. Organizations such as the American Medical Association, which was formed in 1847, continually pushed for the professionalization and regulation of medicine. Essentially, they worked to keep the practice of medicine out of the hands of lay healers like midwives. Additionally, pain-relieving chloroform and ether were both used for women in childbirth for the first time in 1847. Isn't it? Doesn't it gain popularity with Queen Victoria? Queen Victoria's like gets um, I think it's ether, and she's like, "This is the shit." 
well, I'm never doing it without this again. And then other women are like, well, if the queen's doing it, it becomes more popular. Anyway, uh, this uh, pain relief allowed women to be relieved of some of the pain of childbirth, which, you know, for the record, is terrible, while further increasing <laughs> medical dominance in obstetrics and gynecology. And to be clear, middle and upper class women began seeking out professional medical care. It was fashionable and the new thing to have a medically trained doctor who administered pain relievers and sedatives and who might even be able to use metal forceps, something that midwives on a whole did not use because of the potential complications that went along with them. Um, But they could help to speed along a delivery. So as more male physicians were admitted to assist with birth and miscarriage, their knowledge and their expertise increased. As the century progressed, it became more normal to have a male physician attend women during childbirth and miscarriage. One of the best parts of Withacombe's book, Lost, is her study on how women during the 19th century actually felt about and experienced miscarriage. She combed through women's diaries and family papers to find evidence of their miscarriages and what they had to say about them. It's important to point out that the written historical records that we have, so say papers found in archives, are usually saved because someone deemed them important enough to save. Um, And this typically means that these types of written sources normally represent the voices of white men and occasionally white women. So it's important to remember that these weren't the experiences of all American women at all. However, the writings that Withacombe explored regarding women's miscarriage gives us more information on the matter than really previously thought possible. Right. The personal writings of women who miscarried in the 19th century ran the gamut from relief to sadness to even joy at the outcome of a miscarriage. Emily McCorkle Fitzgerald was the wife of an army surgeon who was stationed in Sitka, Alaska in the late 1840s. In a letter home to her mother, Fitzgerald wrote about the hardships of raising children in an unfamiliar and harsh environment. She wrote, I have not been feeling well for a month. I know I look badly, and I know doctor has been a little concerned, for he has put me on cod liver oil and iron and quinine and all those lovely things. I did not think I would tell you until I saw you, but I will now. I had a miscarriage about five or six weeks ago, but I lost a great deal of blood and all my strength. I have not gotten over it yet. However, Fitzgerald went on to write... Quote, I am thankful now that I did have it, meaning the miscarriage, as another Sitka baby would have been my fate. Her relief is evident in her letter. Fitzgerald's letters to her mother were filled with the domestic responsibilities of raising young children. She was obviously not in a hurry to add another one. Remember, this is a time when women did not have much control over their fertility or the spacing and timing of their children. In 1875, Annie Eumanns Van Ness wrote about her miscarriage in her diary. Her and her husband's financial situation was not good, and in January, she suspected she was pregnant. She wrote that it made her feel, quote, very cross and irritable. Two weeks later, she wrote, quote, I am happy again. A week ago last night, I was taken sick at the supper, supper table. I went to my room and retired early. To make a long story short, I will say that the next day, Ma told me she had seen her first grandchild. And then Van Ness went on to write, I just happened to think that anybody might imagine from reading this that I had had a baby, but I haven't. It was only what they call a miss. It wasn't any larger than a jointed doll. So, Clearly, Van Ness was also relieved by her miscarriage, even able to talk very flippantly about it. Yeah, yeah. Mary Cheney described her miscarriage in 1879 as a relief as well, but also expressed sadness at the experience. The Cheneys had nine children by that time. Who boy. In a letter to her husband regarding her miscarriage, she wrote, Oh, bliss, oh, rapture unforeseen, the imaginary number 10, whom I had already begun to love, is not a real entity as yet and will not be for a long time to come. She went on, clearly saddened by the event, but also relieved. She she wrote, I don't know that we are called on to mourn the loss of a child, but you will perhaps wonder at me that I found it at first so hard to part with my trial, meaning her pregnancy and miscarriage, for trial it has been, but one in which much sweetness has been delivered. 
It's actually a bit of a surprise to read these kinds of accounts about miscarriage because motherhood was such an important and critical element to popular conceptions of womanhood in the 19th century. And yet, birth control and family planning were almost impossible for many women. Women who wanted to control their fertility, to keep their children paced in years, to not be pregnant every year for the rest of their lives, had little control short of just staying away from their husbands for as long as possible, right? So I guess in that respect, these reactions to miscarriage, you know, make a little more sense. Yeah, absolutely. Throughout most of the 19th century, most women and doctors viewed miscarriage as a kind of correction, as nature's way of fixing a non-viable pregnancy, or even just a delayed menses. After roughly the 1840s, however, doctors began to view miscarriage as something over which they had expertise and as a type of medical malady that could be fixed or studied. Women, on the other hand, had varying views of doctors' expertise when it came to their miscarriages, as doctors had little to no actual ways to help their patients during miscarriage or to stop the process. Withicombe found in many women's diaries and personal papers that women were disappointed in the medical help they received during a miscarriage. In 1856, Gertrude Thomas had a miscarriage. She wrote, quote, Early the next morning, I found that I was in such a situation as to frighten me with fears of sickness. Coming up home, we called by for Dr. Eve. Nothing that he did, in fact, he did nothing, proved efficacious. And on Monday, I had an abortion at two months. Now, note her use of the term abortion, which prior to the 20th century, and even actually into the 20th century, was an interchangeable term with miscarriage. Women wrote about having an abortion in ways that made it clear the event was neither intended nor induced, and doctors described abortions as mostly accidental. By Gertrude Thomas's own words, it was evident that she had a miscarriage, had called the doctor for assistance, and was disappointed when he did nothing. Medical instructors, so doctors teaching doctors, and medical textbooks instructed doctors in the 1840s and 1850s to generally let nature take its course when a woman was miscarrying. For the first two-thirds of the century, physicians described miscarriage as something occurring naturally and warned of the possible dangers of interference in the event. In 1856, physician G.S. Palmer was called to treat a woman who was experiencing a strange pain in the vagina and had been experiencing pain and discharge for four weeks prior. When Palmer examined the woman, he found a five-month fetus in her birth canal, which he removed easily. However, his attempts to help her expel the placenta by giving her ergot, which helped uterine contractions, did not produce the desired result and instead produced a, quote, frightful hemorrhage. Instead of forcing things along, Palmer wrote that he stemmed the hemorrhage blood flow with a tampon and let nature take its course. Four days later, she expelled part of the placenta. He was called back to her home four months later to find the woman flooding copiously until she finally delivered the rest of the placenta. Oh, that poor woman. That sounds like such an ordeal. A long time. It is a very long time. But Palmer wrote about the event in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal as a successful treatment, Mm. closing his article with these words, quote, thus did nature hermetically seal up and perfectly protect from decomposition in a high temperature for four months, a foreign substance, which it could not throw off at the proper time. And when the system returned to a proper state and condition, she relieved herself by the same. Right. So Palmer is basically saying that the body is a mechanism of nature. Mm -hmm. It did its natural thing. And when it was done, all was well. And with the Combs research through all of these medical journals and textbooks found that this was pretty much a basic understanding among American physicians. This, however, began to change during the 1870s. Mm. This shift in the latter part of the 19th century, again, coincided with another mass migratory and economic transformation in America. Massive immigration into the country, as well as migration of native-born young people to urban centers along the East Coast, further disrupted old social networks. For new immigrant women, their families and the reproductive networks they would have utilized in their home countries were simply not available in their new cities. 
young women were often separated from women knowledgeable about reproduction. Additionally, cramped urban housing meant that there often simply wasn't room for laboring or miscarrying women to be taken care of in the home. Thus, the rise of the maternity or lying in hospital in America was born. These charity hospitals were founded to help poor and unmarried women with medical care. In exchange for the free or low-cost medical care women received, their experiences were used as training for new doctors, nurses, and medical students. As poor and working class women began to enter the maternity hospitals, the power dynamic between miscarrying women and medical professionals began to shift. Middle and upper class women who invited a doctor into their home held some power over what they would and would not allow a doctor to do. Women within a charity hospital, however, did not have that kind of authority. Doctors could study women's miscarrying bodies and the tissues they expelled more readily than they could in a quote-unquote respectable woman's home environment. The knowledge doctors gained from working on the poor they could then use as a means to establish themselves professionally, either by using that knowledge with their private paying clients or through publications in prestigious medical journals. Additionally, the more physicians were called on in times of miscarriage, the more familiar with the event they became. By the 1880s, physicians began to describe miscarriage as an abnormality or pathology that only their medical skills could adequately deal with. Instructors advised physicians to clear out the uterus as quickly and efficiently as possible using their fingers, metal instruments, or if necessary, their whole hand. Whitacombe found a change in the language used in these texts later in the century. No longer was a miscarriage happening to a female patient, but to a uterus. Physician J.S. Baer wrote in 1897 that, quote, an empty uterus was a safe uterus, and the organ is only safe when it is empty. Additionally, Withycombe found surgical instrument catalogs rarely sold curettes in the mid-19th century, but by 1899, they were extremely popular and marketed as useful tools for extracting miscarriage tissues. According to reports in medical journals, physicians attended an increasing amount of miscarriage cases between the years 1870 to 1900. Additionally, domestic health texts increasingly encouraged women to seek out professional medical care when they experienced a miscarriage, as opposed to letting nature kind of take its course. Doctors began seeing the value of attending miscarriage, particularly because of the amount of miscarriages they were seeing when poor and immigrant women came to see them through maternity hospitals. Additionally, women themselves began to see a value in seeking out professional medical help during a miscarriage. These coinciding threads culminated into a construction of miscarriage as an abnormal medical phenomenon that was an event that brought a healthy pregnancy to an unhealthy end. The close reading of medical texts, domestic health books, and the diaries and personal papers of women illustrates how popular conceptions of miscarriage changed over the 19th century into an understanding of miscarriage as a medical anomaly. The increased medicalization of miscarriage had another impact on scientific study and understandings of human development. As more physicians attended miscarriage, they were able to probe and study the actual products of miscarriage, the fetal tissues and placenta that came out of women's bodies. Collections of fetal tissue began to line the walls of private doctors and university labs. There's little evidence from women's writings as to what they did with the matter that came out of their bodies during or after a miscarriage. Most likely, many women had little issue with the materials of their miscarriage going home with their attending physician. Archaeological evidence from the 19th century and before shows that much of the material from miscarriages wound up in privies and other disposal sites. However, some women chose to bury the results of the miscarried pregnancy. Caroline Healy Dahl described the miscarriage of her five-month-old fetus in 1847, writing, quote, It is impossible not to love it, though it should prove an abortion. The fetus had no thumb on the right hand, but instead five fingers, the fifth growing out of the first. The smaller intestines were formed on the outside, and the scrotum was deficient. Her husband buried the little one with his own trembling hands. Aww. 
So it's it's interesting to point out that Doll had also had a miscarriage the year before when she was three months along, but she did not mention in her diary what she and her husband did with the outcome of that earlier miscarriage. Yeah. And so one could assume that perhaps they, it, you know, they, they were disposed of because perhaps they did not... Uh, it did not bear as much resemblance to a fully formed human. Mm. However, that's only an assumption. We don't know for sure because she didn't write it down. But women and families who miscarried at home, they had the power to decide what they would do with the products of miscarriage. Right. As physicians attended more miscarriages, however, they began to collect the expelled matter and tiny beings for scientific study. Many histories center the emergence of the field of embryology in Europe, but Whitcomb argues that American physicians and anatomists were also integral to the growth of the field. More importantly, understanding women's attitudes about miscarriage was critical to the emergence of this new field of study. The importance of obtaining miscarried materials increased as throughout the 19th century, reference to the products of a miscarriage changed from descriptors such as fruits, bubbly lots, moles, and other indiscernible objects that were expelled from the vagina were replaced by a sense of scientific excitement as to the marvels of human development available from the body of a miscarrying woman. For physicians interested in adding to the study of fetal and human development and increasing their own professional expertise, attending a miscarrying woman was the easiest way to obtain fetal tissues. A Dr. Hendricks displayed um, what he termed an interesting specimen to the St. Louis Medical Society in 1884, a seven-month-old fetus complete with the placenta. He explained that he had been called to the bedside of a woman in miscarriage, but because he arrived late, he had not been able to rupture the membranes to speed the delivery along. On account of his tardiness, he was able to procure the delivered fetus, which was still inside the placenta. He did not say anything about negotiating with the woman to allow him to keep the fetus, but since this seemed to be a private delivery in a home, it can be assumed that she agreed to let him take it. That wasn't always the case, however, as a Dr. T.R. Rubush described his inability to take a pair of five-month developed twin specimens from a home in 1892 as the, quote, parents objected to it. And so this shows us that women who had miscarriages in their homes with a hired physician had a say in the matter of deciding what was a fetus, what was a child, what was a clot, you know, what, what, what this was. Right. right. Yeah, that's so interesting. This wasn't the case for Ohio physician James Irvine, however, who, upon delivering a full-term healthy baby to a Mrs. S., discovered that she also delivered a premature fetus. Wait, wait how did that work? Twins. A full-term healthy baby and a premature fetus? Preterm. Like, it died at, like, oh, two so months it, along and would just, and like, floated it, around. Okay, okay, okay. I see. I was like, how did that... How is one preterm one made the and other? One, yeah. <laughs> okay, I understand. So, like, one was uh, probably still with the umbilical cord. So, so it was, was... some blood flow, but it didn't develop. It, right, further. so it wasn't... Because you know how it can be, like, really bad if it, if it... You know, if you have a miscarriage, but it's not expelled. So, it was... Because it wasn't like decomposing internally, right? It like right. still had blood flow, right? But it so, just had so, stopped developing, right? So oh. that can actually happen. From yeah, what I understand quite often, right? So they still right. have like the umbilical cord and everything, right. but they're not necessarily getting like the hormones and the nutrients yeah, that they yeah. need in order to develop. So they just kind of yeah hang out. Okay, interesting. All right. Um, Irvine wrote that, quote, this preterm fetus I concealed under the bedclothes, informing my patient and the bystanders that it was merely the passage of a few clots of blood. He, quote, directed the all inquisitive nurse to go downstairs and make the mother a cup of tea. And during her absence, ascertained that the mass first expelled was a fetus from four to five months in a high state of preservation. Another physician reported a similar event and told his audience, quote, it must be remembered that the mother does not know of the second fetus, giving some indication that the physician was deceiving her so as to collect the fetus for study. Another physician recounted a case where he attended a miscarriage that consisted of one fetus and two placentas and, quote, regretted exceedingly since the occurrence of this circumstance that I had not pocketed the curious productions for preservation in alcohol. Man, that is so similar 
to the language that I have doctors talking about when it comes to weird things that they see uh, in soldiers wounded or killed mm. or whatever during the civil war it's the yeah. same thing like man i wish i had saved that weird case that i saw yeah. it's it's so well because it's the rise of the collection yes right? and it's exactly what i'm going to talk about you know in my episode in later episode. on yeah all right see how they all fit together mm-hmm Right. And so so these examples of specimen collection, right. uh, you know, they, they are like an episode. Did you do it with me? The episode no. of the right. OK, the rise Marissa. of the, the Natural History Museum. Mm-hmm. But, you know, how scientific knowledge was built on these, you know, huge collections of specimens. Absolutely. And then like your 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 original research on like the Army Medical um, Hospital and then yep, what the, the episode Museum. you're going to do next. What's what is the episode you're going to do next? It's specifically on Native American bone collecting. OK. And race. Right like race science um and it's it, it's yeah it's exactly the same time period right where right. doctors are increasingly focused on their anatomical knowledge as a way of kind of uh asserting their authority and their professionalism you right. know and but, and but where also, do they get that i mean also just how like this the scientific knowledge during this period is just built on this massive amount of material collection, right? right? Exactly. Like yeah. you, you have to have the things in yes. the bottles of the alcohol, right? And it's, it's not just, just it's learning about it; it's having. You it. have to have it, mm-hmm. and, you know. And as we explained in the other in the in the rise of the scientific, the, the what was it? The natural history museums, you know, like with with animals and things like that. Like you know, they would even collect birds in all stages of molting, yes. right? Because you have to have that like physical material. Uh, scientific specimen there right. to be able to see and study and things like exactly. that. Exactly. Um, and so these just massive collections, you know, all of our modern day museums and our kind of university um, anatomical collections and things like that all started during this time. Yes. Right? Right. Yeah. And then additionally, scholars have done a lot of work on exploring how Western museums and universities collected, you know, the bones and the cultural materials of indigenous and non-Western peoples, right? Mm-hmm. So there's also this kind of like imperialism. Absolutely. Uh, colonialism yeah. going on with all of that as well. But so in terms of, of this episode and mes- miscarriage, it's it's really interesting to think about the ways that a lot of scientific knowledge that we kind of take for granted was produced. Yeah, exactly. And so these examples of fetal and tissue collection that with the comb has uncovered really make us think about this point of transfer from woman's body to lab of these products of miscarriage and how often it was women's conceptions of what the products of their miscarriage actually were that allowed these quote unquote specimens to make it into networks of scientific research, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, exactly. This is something that, um, I mean, you mentioned sort of the, how the scientific knowledge that we, that we have now, we, we, we often don't think about how we got to, what we think of as kind of standard scientific and medical knowledge and uh-huh. that often it's kind of tied to these kind of shady right medical histories right yeah but it's also i mean this is like foucault all up in here right this is the rise of the medical authority doctors uh-huh. were able to do this yes because of their desires to learn more about the wonders of human creation and science and all this stuff but they were able to do it because they were figures of authority right right and so this power dynamic and you know and i think about it too like you know in this one case with a comb you know argues that that women in the in the in their home could decide what the product of yes. their miscarriage was but when you think about the women that were in the the maternity hospitals right. and the lying in hospitals that's where that kind of power authority really kind of gets skewed, right? And right. they don't they don't have the the power to you know say yeah. yay or nay. This is what I want. This is what I don't want. Or yeah. have the power over once the their fetus or whatever is expelled, what they want to do with yeah. it. You know, right? And like some of the women in here who the doctors said like I would really like to take this with me, and they said no. Yeah, right. The, and the, they had the that mothers power. and fathers said no. I don't want yeah. that. Right. Um, but these other women, as you're saying, didn't yeah. have that power because the doctors would have just whisked it away. Yeah. Right. They Without they would have quote unquote pocketed it. Right. Yeah. And I, I something that I think is really important. I've been following Shannon's work for a long time. Through um, she's written several times for us at Nursing Clio, and one of the things I think is so so important about her work is this. Um, the the work that she does on how women themselves conceived of this, yeah, right? Women yeah. have 
always thought about miscarriage in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. And as you say, you know, whether it was a fetus or whether it was a baby or whether it was something that was loved or whether it was a collection of cells, like Mm -hmm. women made those decisions themselves and often could feel differently from one miscarriage to another. Right. One might be really devastating. Another might be a big relief. And I think that I don't one thing I don't know, and maybe she explores this in the rest of the book is, is how whether or not society judged women for how they felt about it. But I think that's something that really happens now. I don't think you're as much allowed to well, say today, she, gosh, that's a big relief. I, I'm glad that that no, happened. She, uh, with it comes specifically lays that out. That, yeah. that there, there's not a point in our current conversation for that type of yeah. relief. Yeah. Right. That, um, there's there's like there's one way we're supposed to think about it right and there's no other there's no other ways that you can think about it yeah. but then also you know she she actually brings up her her own miscarriage yeah and how in the hospital nobody would actually say you're experiencing a miscarriage yeah they were saying things like um we can't find your pregnancy yeah and things like that so kind of leaving her with this this unsettled state of like how am I supposed to feel? Did I actually right. just have a, a miscarriage or, yeah. and, and so, and so where do I kind of put that socially? Yeah. You know, how does that fit in? Yeah. yeah. How does that feel, fit in with this like preconceived notion of what miscarriage is? Right. And all that, you know, which is kind of why I constructed the, our opening paragraph of like, um, Oh, what did I say? I don't know. But just, just basically like there's, there's only one way to think about yes. it in our Today. current conversation. Right. And it it doesn't allow for, you know, varying feelings about that. Right. And then I think for me, the most interesting part is like realizing that that is such a cultural construction yeah. and that women in the 19th century um, may not have, have felt the way yeah. that we think we're supposed to feel. Right. When because we happens. think like motherhood is motherhood. Right. Like yeah. all women re- have over time reacted the same way to the prospect of becoming mothers right, which is it's not, true, not the case. right no it's yeah. not true at all you know and yeah. um and women based on their sort of the situations that they were in or their experiences or how many other children they had or how many other pregnancies they had had might feel totally differently about a miscarriage right. you know and and even over the course of their own lifetimes because right. many of these women had more than one right. you know right. um and today many women have more than one i just i think that that's so important knowing that history is so important to how we should be thinking about miscarriage today and sort of giving us, giving each other not only the place to talk more openly about miscarriage, but also get, extending that sort of empathy to each other that mm-hmm. it's okay if you think of that as a relief. It's also okay if you think of it as a heartbreak. It's a devastating, you know? yeah. yeah. I mean, all of, there's, yeah, all yeah, of there's this a space. Right. Yeah, it's such such an important book. I'm so glad that we were able to do this episode. Yes, um, thank you, Shannon, for yes, sharing that with thank you. Thank you. That was a good marketing uh, <laughs> marketing on your part. Yes. <laughs> so, and of course, and I I do want to say like any miss construing of your arguments is, is all on me <laughs> yeah not even me you can't even blame me for that no I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh so that is it for us today um thank you again so much to shannon with a comb for sending us that brand spanking new book uh lost miscarriage in 19th century america listeners if you would like a little more information on reproduction throughout history, check out our show notes for sources used in this episode and some suggestions for further reading. Also that we ask that if you enjoy our episodes, please leave us a review in your podcast app. We're not joking when we say that reviews help us grow this podcast. The more reviews our podcast has, the more the podcast apps show our podcast to potential listeners. So please leave us a five star review. Mm hmm. And you can always check out past episodes at digpodcast.org. You can follow us on Facebook and at Twitter at dig underscore history. You can donate to our Patreon account uh, on patreon.com backslash dig podcast. And uh, also a plug for our Facebook group, Dig History Pod Squad, for some behind the scenes discussions and some fantastic history memes as well. And I don't think we mentioned, but you should read Shannon's book and buy it. And put some money in her pocket or go to the library and get it. But, you know, buying it's always a good thing, too. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Farewell. 
This podcast was produced by the historians of Dig, Elizabeth Garner Masaryk, Sarah Hanley Cousins, Marissa Rhodes, and me, Avril Earls. Thanks for listening. In 1875, Annie Humans. Yeah, humans. Humans. <laughs> how some people say I know what do I say season (laughs) (laughs) the steam printing power additionally pain reveal pain revealing (laughs) oh here's something (laughs) their expenses were used at oh my god in ex get it out shake it out I'm running away coming home we were coming home this wasn't the case for hope Hawaii. Hawaii. <laughs> they began to collect the expelled manor. Oh my god. They began to expel the. Take a breath. What is wrong with me? Right now? As a Dr. T.R. Rubash. Rubbish? Rub- yeah. Rubash? Rubash. I really hope it's rubbish. Rubbish. <laughs> yeah. Assisted in the care of the rest of the household, right? So, like cleaning, laundry, food preparation. Food preparation. <laughs> this woman's. Sorry, preparation. <laughs> It reminded me of Pepper Ann. Pepper Ann, Pepper Ann, Pepper Ann marching in her own parade. I have no idea who that was. Oh, was it Carter? Pepper Ann. Pepper Ann. Pepper Ann. She was awesome. Okay. Oh, it's not. It, it's actually just that I remember that I was supposed to borrow Gattaca. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I just. What did I, I like, do? I was supposed to remember something and I started looking around the room like, what was it? Okay, thanks, pal. Welcome, pal.